glad I was able to get you on. I first heard about you from, uh, well, it seems like every guest I'm getting on at the, nowadays comes from something I heard on either the Event Is Coming Soon YouTube channel or the Higher Self YouTube channel, two of my favorite YouTube channels. Only subscribe to them on weekends. On weekdays, I prefer to watch documentaries, but on weekends, I prefer to listen to those channels in particular. And um, whatever whatever it was that I that I heard that, that you wrote or did or whatever, I obviously must have thought after that, holy shit, this guy knows what he's talking about. I need to get him as a guest on my show. He's definitely worthy of being a, a guest on a show that seeks to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it is not, as I seek to do. So, um, for those people that haven't heard of you, um, I'm not quite sure if you have a website. Uh, do you have a website, by the way? My website is uh, on the best way to reach me in terms of looking at work and things I do would be on uh, the Illusion of Us on Facebook, and then also my YouTube page at Matthew Lacroix, L A C R O I X. The Illusion of Us. Yes. That's on Facebook, you say? And there's a page called that. Okay. I, oh, I see. I, I did like it at some point. Um, the Suppression and Evolution of Human Consciousness. Uh, that's that's you. To discover the secrets of ancient history. Then has yeah. like red and blue um, colors going that, through the earth. Okay. That's the cover of, of my uh, my book. Tell you tell you a little better, and whoever may be listening. Um, I when I was going down the road of discovering all these hidden truths, I, I became almost obsessed and very driven to find out what the truth was, not only behind understanding what re reality around me, but also understanding ancient history, because that's truly the only way to understand how we got to this place now and, and who we are and, and everything that's going on is understanding the past. And so by putting that together, which is which has been very difficult to do because of all the the orchestrated efforts against it to hide it um but for those of us who have been driven enough and maybe objective enough to look at the evidence in the correct order you know we've kind of put this this story together our story together and i I've, I've had once i started compiling in my in my mind and, and started just you know writing down little things here and there i started it started to almost become like an anxiety build up where i couldn't hold it back any longer i just had i had to write I had to write it down because it was – to me, the, our story hasn't really been told, and it's been only told in, in fragments and pieces, and it's an incredible story. And it helps us understand the importance of, of who we are, and it, it changes our entire life. And so I wrote the book, um, The Illusion of Us, um, which, is, which is the suppression and evolution of human consciousness, and I just came out with the second edition, just doing a whole overhaul because I wanted a book where if someone was – um, either a, more of a veteran truther and, and just wanted a, a really good book that kind of compiled all this together in an order, or someone who maybe did, doesn't hasn't gone down this road at all and wants a place to start and something that um, gives both an ancient history perspective but also a look at what consciousness is and, and the ways we can advance ourselves and then, all, of course, where are we going and what's the future. So I try to put all this kind of a little guide together, and then from there I've – I want I want I wanted to do shows like with you because there's so much to tell and so much to uncover and people just don't really understand what's real and what's been inverted and what's kind of just a myth. And so it's pretty captivating when we can put it together as a as a collective community and and come to an, an agreement in so many places just looking at the evidence. No no question and uh when it comes to the the illusion of of us, uh, the the illusion, the matrix that we are living in. Uh, lots of people nowadays seem to think that um, in in this present day, it's not really in our best interest to obsess too much about the powers that be and the and the matrix and all that. Because I mean, they're at a point, for all intents and purposes, where well, they are at a point where they have to cannibalize themselves in order to keep surviving. The archive control system does. And that's not me talking. That's Kashi Records reader Andrew Barnes is talking. Um, so many would assert that uh, don't talk about them or obsess about them or you'll give them power. I, on the other hand, assert that it's okay to talk about them and expose them as long as your intention is to put a stop to their agenda because as long as that is your intent, then you're definitely not going to be – giving them any power. Now, we could uh, d uh, debate and disagree all along on, as to whether or not um, 
it's a good idea or bad idea or the best way or not the best way to to go about expanding consciousness by by exposing them i mean the way one way i look at it is like we are only as strong as our weakest link and whatever um part of our consciousness our matrix that the powers that be our kind of control system still has control over we can think of that as our weakest link and it is in our best interest to well first of all expose it and second of all do whatever we can to to put a stop to it i mean people like jim self you're, will disagree but you seem to think i'm on the right track or do you no you're right Th- those are good points and this is something that um we we got to go over a couple things here is when you come across information and when you're coming across trying to put together the story of like you said some of these darker aspects of our timeline when we've had th- these you know darker energies and darker people and darker beings who have not wanted us to advance our consciousness who have done everything in their power to call us and keep us in wars and all these various means and and we have to kind of realize if by not talking about them is that just a way where we don't give them any energy and it just kind of doesn't it doesn't exist cuz we create our own reality or if by talking about them are we you know invoking energy to them so it's it's this difficult decision where we have to figure out and i the, the conclusion i've come to is if someone is a so, if someone feel, feels like they're sovereign with their consciousness where they they feel like they can kind of hold their own thoughts and they're not being influenced by anybody and they and they they feel um confident with them within their own their own mind i think it's it's okay as long as that person feels confident to go brave into these very, very disturbing areas, learning about the tragedies of how evil things like World War II and World War I, all these components that have gone into the, this very, very sinister and dark side of our history. But it's necessary to learn it. It's necessary to understand what happened because we have to stop it. Like you said, we have to take control because control has been taken from us. The way that we perceive our, our 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 timeline of events occurring is is almost completely um, different than and than what the masses realize, and that it's actually a coerced set of events put in place to try to um, instigate things to go a certain direction by starting instability in some part of the world where you want to start a war or or creating some maybe a terrorist action or something. These are just these are simply means. Of directing us in a certain way, and so the only way to disempower them would be to learn the truth of what's going on and how the basically how the banking banking systems are the ones propping up all this evil. So let's look at this from the angle of of all of these dark and sinister things that are that we really need to stop and we really need to change to move forward to a better a better time. You know these things that were people that like like us that are truthers that are trying to fight this this tyranny of of lower consciousness. We have to simply not dread in the fear of what they're doing and, and allow them to give them energy. You know, this whole giving praise to saying amen when you and you realize that's simply praising Amin Ra, the, the god of Egypt, who was Marduk. You know, these are all little sinister ways for us to give our energy to them. And so, if you if you were to learn about some of these dark things and you start cowering and you start going into despair and your life is ruined you've now given them your energy and like you said you've now you've now done something where you've caused yourself harm too because you weren't ready you know not everybody's ready to go down this the the deep dark roads of our truth and our timeline it takes courage and it takes bravery for people don't nobody should think that this is an easy road to take where everybody can just jump on board and go down sail the easy train towards enlightenment it's the most difficult thing you'll ever do in your life. So my advice to conclude this long kind of explanation is take everything in stages for when you're ready, for when you, when you, when you yourself know that you're ready because we must go down and understand and stop the things that are, that are occurring because there are very, very dark and, and sinister things that are happening right now. If we – let's just take ourselves out of the perspective of being some – a person here on the on the ground trying to trying to look at all this like like a timeline perspective try to zoom out try to see if pretend you were you were a, an advanced being who had you were in a, in a higher dimension and you could kind of perceive timeline and events and all these different things you would be you would be planning things based on these astronomical and astrological things that's how everything is driven that's the obsession with with every the events that are undergo our in our in our lives are are using eclipses and using you know um 
equinoxes and all these things. That's always been what they do, and especially the zodiac symbols. So you brought up two very important points, the eclipses and um, this, these zodiac changes we're about to go through. And I, I agree with you. I see these eclipses as being the beginning, representing the beginning and the end of the great change, the great change over years. Because if you look at how um, at how these zodiacal periods utilize the like, um, if a if a time period is uh, a positive or a negative time period, you know, is it is it driven by um, tyranny and evil for, for several thousand years or is it this this enlightened period and you can see that that this this seesaw balance up and down all throughout history of these times when that changed and you can match that with these zodiacal times in the in the in the, in the celestial sky when you say well we were just in this time of pisces for the last several thousand years and if you look it was a negative polarity meaning it was it was one of these it was a situation where negative energy was allowed to reign for that time period, and so it did. And look at everything that's, that's happened during this time of Pisces. It's been probably the most evil time in human history. And so look at where we're going, though. What's happening right now? We're, we're getting this, this big eclipse that's, eclipse, right, that's going across the country, and then we're getting this one that's going across the reverse during this period. And what is this period? Right now we're entering what I consider the beginning of – a lot of changes that are about to happen, both environmentally, geologically, politically, religiously, across the entire spectrum. And, and if you look at when we transition to Aquarius, which is the next zodiacal symbol, which is a positive polarity, a time of swinging the, the complete opposite way, that's 2025 around that time period. And you just said this second eclipse that goes around that comes the opposite way is 2024. So it's, it, it would signal that perfect time period of transition between leaving, leaving um, Pisces and entering this time of Aquarius. And so if we use that as a gauge and then we look at all the prophecies talking about Revelation and talking about the Mayans and talking about all, you know, all these cultures that talked about this great change over time that they all knew and they all saw coming, we're in that right now for the next eight or so years. This is going to be um, – this is going to be a very dynamic period, and the more people discover truth during this time of acceleration, I like to call it, the more we're going to kind of consciously take back our reality. But uh, looking at the uh, cover of your book, The Illusion of Us, um, would I be correct in assuming that the color is red and blue, the, those gases um, circling the, the, the planet that's meant to mimic the red and the blue pill of the Matrix, or is that something completely different? It, it's, it's many things. You're right. That's one of the aspects. Now – um, this is one of these hidden aspects of reality that I think almost the majority of society has been very cleverly deviated away from, and it's, and it's understanding the fabric of reality itself. What are things composed of? And the matrix, matrix the reason they use those colors, it's a very purposeful thing. Those colors are represented. They don't. They don't represent color like we we see it as. Um, oh, just that's red and that's blue. That doesn't really mean anything to me. They represent s specific vibrations, specific vibrations and wavelengths. Okay. So when I was kind of going down this road, I mean, one day I think um, there was a Nova special on, and they were talking about how if if you take the, 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 vis the visible light spectrum we can see, and you see like a rainbow, which is the only time we can truly see that entire visible light spectrum because we're so limited. You see a rainbow, right, shining by. If you were to take and take a thermometer and measure each color of that of the rainbow, a visible light like shining in a window, they would all have different temperatures. And when I heard that, all of a sudden these wheels started connecting and all and it was like a, it was like a mind explosion because here was this gigantic thing that no one had ever no, that, that doesn't get talked about at all and yet it connects to everything i all of a sudden i realized I, I, I my mind went to see something like lava in a slow state and all of a sudden red makes sense to me in these in these colors and all of a sudden and i started connecting the fact that everything was simply just energy in certain states including color and then it started driving me to the idea where if not only if if that's true, then it, does it get to even even higher levels than that? You, you look at a human who are composed of seventy percent water, which means that automatically our matching vibration is blue, 
and, and, and you look at those matching vibrations and all those various things, and you look at something like red, which has the slowest vibration, and every single electronic device we, ha- device we have on the planet is geared towards emitting these really low-frequency red signals. All of a sudden, it, be- it started connecting to me very quickly that, that we were these, we're these modem antennas that are functioning a certain way. And we're being bombarded by these constant means to keep us in, the, in a lower state. And, and then I started to look back at history and the symbolism used by different factions of the gods in, in, in versus – and I called that, that battle the battle of the eagle and the serpent because they use these symbology. But I also found an even deeper side to it where not only were they using the symbology of the certain things that they represented, but there was even colors represented too because blue – it had always represented to them the highest state that represented like the human higher state. And purple, of course, was a combination of all the colors combined, so they used it for royalty. But red was always considered the opposite state. And if you and if you start looking at the human energy body and the fact that we have seven chakras in our body, seven chakra centers in our body, this is very important to understand. Specifically designed this way, and there are seven colors in the visible light spectrum. Go back to that rainbow again. That's us. And those those colors, those specific vibrations, all they represent is our body reaching a certain energy state. And so people are kept in the lowest possible state because of everything that's gone on, and, and they, they try to keep everybody away from the truth and in a certain state of reality. And the lowest state we have, our root chakra, the lowest possible consciousness we can exist in, is red. It's the, it's the, it's the, that's, that's what the representation is for that energy, that vibration. And so you look at how everything's geared towards a red vibration from cell phones and, and wireless signals and all these things are keeping us in this certain state. And then you look at how every chakra uh, gaining ourselves higher towards a higher state is is following the exact colors of the, of the is visible light spectrum and every color ascending is of course getting a higher and higher vibration that's all it is every color is simply representing a certain state of vibration and so if human beings are meant to exist in this certain blue state of vibration and we're being kept in our root chakra if anybody is controlled through fear fear is the ultimate controller to keep people in the root chakra that's why all of a sudden these these families, the, like these elite families that were controlling things, it, it started to blow my mind when I learned things like, and I'm sure you know this, the name Rothschild, which is this head family that then had sectors like the Rockefellers in the United States. If you were to take their name, which we could, you could uh, be anybody who looks into the, the dark history would agree that they're the great puppet masters of this world for for the for the humanity, their name in German translates to mean red shield it, it's it, it was like this entire hidden history of this hidden fight to keep to both keep humanity in their lowest state and then trying to keep them in a higher state and now go back to the cover of my book and it shows a planet it shows earth right and it shows this time disappearing in the distance to the left uh, that was red like pisces and it shows blue entering and coming in Almost like – also like the left and right side of the brain because you can connect the, the left and right side of the brain also. Look at politics, red and blue in politics representing Republicans and Democrats. It's always been this, this, this hidden battle where two sides have kind of represented either side of the spectrum and the various gods who have wanted to keep us in a certain state you, and use those to kind of represent themselves. So anything that's based on a warring, purely intellectual, um, conquering, um, domination mentality, that's always the red state. And don't – don't um, we got to be careful because intelligence is not always the best thing without having um, intuition and a kind of an emotional, conscious way to decipher things. In fact, quite the opposite. If someone has too much intelligence and doesn't have any connection to their right brain, they'll often be so lost that they'll never find their way out. It's almost like they become so obsessed with their own ego that they're never able to detach themselves. So in reality, that's how you see what we can where we're perceived as all these geniuses all over the world and various people who are simply just propped up egos who also aren't allowed to even give the truth in some cases. And so we need so for someone to find that perfect balance, they have to balance their right brain and 
it goes deeper. Look at our society, how the system of men are never able to show their emotional side. They're driven only towards barbaric means, and that's their right side of their brain. It's almost like keeping everything is, is meant to keep people unstable and in their lowest state. And so I started to realize there was this giant system in place, enormous system in place to keep us in a certain state and to control history and, and all these things that connected all the way back to the, the Sumerians in ancient Iraq. The, from the cuneiform tablets talking about these, the struggle of the gods and the symbology that they used. And that's why I had to write The Illusion of Us and show, and show those colors because it, this, this battle was so, much, it was so much further than I realized, and it ties right in to what the aspects of – you know into quantum physics of this holographic universe idea of how matter isn't really solid, and it's simply just in various states of vibration. And so that's why color – there's this big obsession with color, right? Where the, if you look at a lot of spiritual um, groups, or they call them the, the rainbow warriors and all these things, because it's, it's always been realized that color simply just represents all of reality itself. There's been a, de a derived, deliberate attempt by some to mislead, in, in many cases for so long. So... I just did um, – you mentioned The Eagle and the Serpent. That's, that's a great one to mention because that's one of the more popular shows I've done. And I just actually um, – this past week just did a coast-to-coast -coast show with George, with George Norrie on The Eagle and the Serpent because it's such a profound aspect of understanding our ancient history that – it really needs to be told, and it, once you understand it, it will um, – and of course, this could fill up the entire rest of the show. Once you understand it, it, it completely makes, makes history make sense, and it makes all the things that are happening right now make sense. And so let's, look, let's go into this. Um, there have been gods in history that the Romans had, that the, the Greeks had, and all these various things, and we've been made to believe that they're myth, when in reality that – if you start looking into these gods and the, tra and the traits that they all had, you realize that they're all connected. And of course, you're much more advanced in this. You know where I'm going here. But we have to understand that the gods were real. And if we realize that and we can understand that they've had profound influences on our timeline, then we have to go look at all of the ways that they've been represented. And the, the history has been fought over so so much, and the and the victors have been the ones who have been able to write it. You know, they, whoever won was always able to stampede and destroy the other army. They were able to write the storybook, and in most cases, um, the ones who are kind of on the wrong side of history have won. So that so the story has been written incorrectly, and that's what we need to put in the right order. And that's why truth is so important, because right now, millions of people are in school. Children, you know, our future, and they're learning an incorrect history. They're learning a history that's been that's been manipulated and kind of put in a certain place where it can't be altered, no matter what the evidence is, because it's it fits into this predetermined narrative, this predetermined narrative that's already been decided, and that says basically. The eagle means freedom, and the snake is evil, and Garden of Eden, there's an evil snake that's tempting Adam and Eve, and God is this good figure that wants to save us. And the, the, the difficult thing to realize is that's all been fake. That's all been a complete inversion and a manipulation of the truth to hide what the actual truth was. Because like I said, the victors who keep have, have won all throughout the time, the zodiacal time of Pisces, has been this war eagle. Okay, now let's let's get something uh, understanding. Eagles are beautiful birds, has nothing to do with eagles. It simply represents this this um, how these gods use symbols for their various sides of their of their family. So if you go back to our earliest records in in um, Sumer, in Iraq, and you look in, into these cuneiform tablets like the Enuma Elish and, and the Atrahasis, you're going to find out these the names of these gods pre Greek and Roman. You know the the, the names that, that they originally had. And you learn like you like the names you just mentioned. You learn these two brothers existed who have basically been commanding and controlling our timeline. And those are Enki and Enlil. And we have to understand and just break down so people know this. This is 
their names E N on the front of their name simply meant Lord. So and Key was Lord of Earth, and so because Earth is not actually the, na- the name of this planet if you read the cuneiform tablets. If you read our early the earliest writings of our most advanced civilizations before things were rewritten, before things were tampered with to get the the true story, you'll learn that the name of Earth was to them was Key K I. So Enki became kind of the lord of the earth, and that's why his name was Enki. And meanwhile, Enlil, his brother, his name was Enlil, which meant lord of the sky or lord of the um, lord of above. So he used the symbology for him in his side of the family as, as the eagle, because the eagle always soars above everything else. It's always looking down, and that was that was his representation. And so right now, right there, you can see that. That's the, that's the representation of him, and of course he had sons, and they had similar representations too. And the most important son he had that has been a major influence on in our history was um, this Sumerian god named Ninurta, who is the god of war. And he was, of course, represented by the Byzantine eagle, the Byzantine empire, the Roman empire. Anytime you see the double-headed eagle, that was always his representation, and of course his big father, Enlil, also known as Zeus – he was the one guiding all, you know, the, this kind of eagle-conquering mentality all throughout history, these armies. And on the other side, we had the snake-dragon side that we still see represented in these ancient cultures like China and Japan. And, and Hinduism still has – in India, we still see this deep representation behind the snake. And we've been made to believe that's evil, but it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense if you start looking at the facts. Let's look at the most obvious fact at first. Fact number one, probably our most important symbol we have in our society is the medical Kandusha symbol. There isn't an honor more bestowed upon people if you're, unless you're a doctor, right? Respect you can get. And our medical Kandusha symbol that you see on every ambulance, every medical building, are these two interwoven snakes with with wings at the top. And of course most people probably don't even recognize it because they see it and it's so it's so subconsciously um they've seen it so many times that they don't, they don't even realize what they're looking at anymore but look at it again. You see these two snakes. Why would our most prestigious symbol have two snakes wound around it unless there's something whole entirely different meaning to it that we've been kind of misled from. Now let's start from the energy standpoint because we kind of talked about that with color and vibration. And we have and we look at the fact that when someone is reaching higher states of their chakra, right, higher vibration, eating healthier, learning the truth, getting outside, getting away from the jungle of concrete jungle of our world, when they're doing that and all those things are falling together, they start changing. They start unlocking their chakras they start meditating they start their body starts changing and that represents these stages of our body and if you look at how those stages occur within our body in our kundalini energy which simply means our highest state it's this intertwined interwound snake energy and then if you look at our dna the double helix representation that's why it's always been shown as a snakes because it represents us reaching our highest state. Now then why would it be snakes, right? Well, Enki has always been represented by as a snake or the dragon. And um, all across Mesoamerica, for the, from Aztecs and Mayans all the way down through the Incas, we see this obsession with the snake and the dragon and this plume plumage, right, these feathers that are all different. And we used to th- I used to think there was an eagle until we started – Really looking at the fact that all the feathers were different in most cases, and they were – it was this big plume. And it's like when, when you start looking what a plumed serpent is, it's just a dragon. So it was always the same thing. It was just, just advanced ways to show the symbology. Now, why would they do that, right? Why would they be showing that? And we have to understand that these two brothers – Poseidon was was the name um, of Enki, and Zeus was the name of Enlil. You know, if we're looking at you know these Greek names and all these names throughout history, they had specific types of guidelines that they followed. For in terms of um, Enki, always was about reaching um, higher consciousness and knowledge because he's the one who who genetically manipulated us early on. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, and of course that sounds crazy to most people. That sounds insane until if you go read these cuneiform tablets. Go read the Enuma Elish. Go read the Atrahasis, and go translate it yourself on Oxford University if you don't trust it and think that it's all made up. 
And if you read that, you learn that we were genet- genetically jump-started from this Neanderthal being and Denisovian being that was, that was here, these early hominids. And we were jump-started by this great god Enki. And he wanted to – he was tasked with basically creating a worker. And But the problem was – he didn't want to just create a stupid worker. He wanted to create a great being because he was a, he was a master geneticist. And if you, if you were a geneticist who could create um, new DNA and new, and, and new life anywhere on any planet or whatever you wanted to do, you would inspire to create a great, a great being. That would always be what you would aspire to eventually, and he did eventually. And that's, that's where our story comes from. You know, we're, this, we're this genetic experiment that um, was given secret gifts – only to be later um, thrown, uh, used as hatred and jealousy by, by those – and Lil and Ninurta and those on the eagle side because what we have to understand and when you start reading these stories, you learn that there was tremendous jealousy that was, that was then created because Enki was not supposed to give us the gifts that they had, you know, their DNA and the, and the gifts that these great gods had, but he secretly did and he created – we have a story of what we think of as Adam and Eve, and we think it's a fairy tale. But if you read these stories, you read that Adam's real name is Adamu, and that he simply represented the first perfect man that was created out of all these experiments. And of course, Enlil was furious because he, he, was, he was actually even more advanced than they could even be. And so this hatred and jealousy stemmed all the way back from the beginning where – where if, if when they first came here, if you think of what the Neanderthal was and what the Denisovian was, we were we were millions of years behind where we are now, in evolutionary standpoint wise, which we've been very much lied to on how ev- evolution really works and how things are really jump started and manipulated. But um, basically, we have to realize is that our story is filled with influences of the past and. We had these gifts instilled within us by Enki, by this by the representative as, as a snake. And that's also why this medical Kadusha symbol has these interwoven snakes because it's always been his intention. No matter what someone wants to try to make you believe, just go read the source. It's always been his intention for us to reach our highest state of consciousness. That's why he included these gifts within us. That's what chakras are. So when – this battle that had been take, that had been ongoing, right? Now that we can look at the two sides, we had this this snake side, which is always higher knowledge, and with with connecting back to like the druids and all the the Egyptians and all these ancient cultures who worship the snake, and we have the eagle, which and you and all along you see that they've been battling. You see that they've had this battle that's been shown in statues and monuments and and, and in writings. And and, and one of the places where it's been most preserved that's pretty amazing is in flags and crests. Because in many cases, when you start learning about history, you're going to say, well, how come I'm not reading about any of this stuff on in the newspapers or online on on TV? Or I don't understand how all this is being covered up. But that's precisely – the, the, the difficulty behind why people never discover truth because it's so big and it's been so manipulated and hiv- hidden that it, unless someone was to follow an order of understanding this, they can they could become pretty lost pretty easily. About uh, th- this whole thing about the um, like the Sumerian tablets and all in their history and the Anunnaki yeah. and all that. Uh, well, first of all, uh, people like some people like James Gilliland have asserted the um, Anunnaki from Nibiru. They they are completely locked out of our reality. Even Brad Johnson, who channels the drone, has asserted that um, there are other types of Anunnaki. It's not just one race. Um, George Kavasilis, when I interviewed him, said the Anunnaki is a hodgepodge of different ETs yes. that can be thought of as the yeah. children of a universal geneticist gene- genetic entity known as Anu, and the Anunnaki from Nibiru are just one faction. Now, the, this whole thing about Zachary Sitchin being accurate or unaccurate is one of the most hotly debated areas in all of um, ancient astronaut theory and alternative history. Um, I assert that uh, Zachary Sitchin supporters have a little leverage that the non-supporters um, have uh, – that don't have, excuse me, and that is that 
Um, Andrew Bartz is the Akashic Records reader who I assert is probably the best source out there for information. That's why I use him as a source so much because his Akashic Records skills can answer almost any question. He did assert in a landmark um, series of interviews that Zachary Sitchin's first three books uh, up into and including The War of Gods and Men are extremely accurate in terms of the events. His timelines are slightly off, but the events are extremely accurate. The Anunnaki, however, they did not come to Nibiru um, because they were on a mission. They were actually lured here, and um, the timing, of, like I said, was a little off, and um, the gold wasn't to shield the atmosphere of their planet. The beer was for, for other reasons. And um, when I uh, heard that, I was quite caught off guard because I heard um, people like uh, Arizona Wilder and Leo Zagami and um, David Icke's Revelations of the Goddess documentary and Leo Zagami is... Um, uh, Project Camelot interview talk about Zachary Sitchin being a fraud, a disinfo agent, even a reptilian alien in disguise, Arizona Wilder asserted. When I um, met Andrew Bartis, I asked him about that, and he said, okay, so how could Sitchin have been accurate if he was a disinformer? And he assured me that all that stuff was disinformation, and those people who said that they were under some sort of a very sophisticated form of timeline mind control that made them think that they were telling the truth when, when in fact they weren't. So apparently there's definitely some sort of a conspiracy on the power, part of the powers that be to um, discredit Zachary Sitchin. And, and keep people from realizing that his work was extremely accurate. However, if we are to believe that Sitchin's work truly is accurate, there's a lot of um, unanswered questions. Well, well, maybe some people they say they're not answered, but a lot of uh, head scratching things that people still would have trouble making sense of. Like Michael Heiser, arguably the um, most prominent of all Zachariah Sitchin critics and skeptics, has um, shown, and this is Carmen Bolter explained this in my interview with her because she worked with Zachariah and she had a lot of difficulty believing he was accurate. Um, she said that Heiser showed that, like, in the tablets, the terms Anunnaki and Nibiru don't really appear together in any way that any um, ordinary, random person of average ordinary prudence could deduce as having some sort of a correlation between them. Um, someone who knew Zachariah Sitchin, who I met at a uh, recent MUFON conference when I discussed uh, that with her, she did tell me um, that one of the misconceptions is that Sitchin um, found the correlation between the Anunnaki and Nibiru from the Sumerian text no, he didn't. She asserted it was actually from Greek texts that he deduced that, and since everybody's become so obsessed with um, Sitchin's work dealing with Sumerian tablets, they don't uh, acknowledge that or uh, know that, but that is what she uh, she asserted. So, like I said, the important thing here, yeah, there's a conspiracy to cover up the fact that Sitchin was accurate, and um, he deserves a lot more credit. we got to rewrite the textbooks to uh, include um, what he wrote. But um, no, there's people that are flat are going to disagree with this. Even Robert Stanley, when I told him this, he still refuses to acknowledge that um, Sitchin was um, accurate and even tried to say uh, the uh, Lost Book of Anki. Did you not check it out? It's a it's an interpretation. It's fiction. Well, t oh, come on. He's being a little um, – a lot of Sitchin's books are interpretations. Does that mean they're fiction? No, I don't think so. But um, have you um, heard any about any of the stuff I've um, talked about, and do you uh, have anything to say about um, – the discrediting um, of Zechariah Sitchin or the attempt to do so. And, um, yeah, maybe there is um, uh, some more, more to this story than what I've just said. Sure. sure. So let me give you an, uh, a, a little kind of comparison to, to kind of give you a, a way to think about this. If someone was to put out a video that's completely truthful and they've done all their research and everything and people are – they watch it and they go, wow, that just blew me away. And they start reading the comments, and they go, they go through the first couple comments, and it's like, wow, that was great. Good job. Good job, God. They feel great. And they go through maybe 10 comments that are all good, but they get one comment that says the whole thing's fake. You've been lied to. What a moron. What an idiot. All these things. And all of a sudden, it's like none of the other comments and none of the other information matter, right? It just disappears within this kind of little this fear that we still have within us of being wrong of saying i'm, I'm not gonna i'm gonna put myself out there and i'm gonna look like an idiot i'm gonna be wrong and then they, they go back and they, they they run back to the herd and they just put their head down they say i you know i try to i try to put myself out there to learn the truth and some someone laughed at me or whatever it was and they can't take it to me anybody who is a truther and hears a zechariah sitchin was all complete fraud, and they and they buy that, and they think all the Anunnaki are all made up. You've been tricked, and more importantly, you have not done enough research yourself to find the truth. And that's the first problem right there, is you need to stop and realize that nobody's going to tell you the truth. You got to find the truth yourself. We're simply guides to help along the way. And so, along let's make let's put a couple of things 
clear here. Let's let's set the stick, the record straight. Not everything Zechariah said, Zechariah Sitchin said, was perfectly accurate. He was someone who took on the impossible, the first person to put this all together. It was unbelievable what he accomplished. It was like the most monumentous feat possible. So if there was some kind of a uh, mathematical calculation that was maybe just missing off by a little bit, people will jump on that and say the whole thing is wrong. Nobody gets truth completely right. I have things that are probably wrong, but I'm willing to under, I'm willing to agree to the fact that I, I would want to fix that if I knew, and so did he. Zechariah Sitchin, if you look in anything that of his work, he was one of the most dedicated truthers in history, and he's been, in my opinion, one of the biggest um, names that it has been inverted and, and demonized of any researcher in history. And it's been so sad to see that because all these things about how he mistranslated everything wrong and that none of it's real and all these things, let me just tell you that you can go to the Oxford University website. You can go and you can translate these cuneiform tablets yourself. Focus on either um, either either the Enuma, Enuma Elish or the Atrahasis. Just start with some of these early ones that just have um, a t tremendous amount of information in them that correlates to what we're talking about. And you'll see that none of that – these aren't made up names, but like all these things in our history. And look at these – look at these um, – these terms that we automatically laugh at, right? Alien, um, Anunnaki. All you have to do is read the early Sumerians. Go yourself and read it. They called their gods, and the Sumerians were what, what is now Iraq, and they were the earliest people we could have, we have records for. And their gods, they called the Anunnaki. It says it right in that. And it simply meant those who from, who from heaven to earth came. And everywhere in the Bible we read about heaven, and we, we haven't really figured out the fact that heaven is simply space. It's always been space. So we've been very cleverly uh, manipulated to somehow think that all of this is a fairy tale, just like we always have been, and that someone mistranslated um, it wrong, and so the whole thing's wrong, right? Isn't that, a, isn't that a clever way to do it? And they've misled thousands and thousands of people. It's so sad to see so many of these truthers who think that the whole thing is just a, is just a myth, and that they believe that that um that all of these these writings have been mistranslated go look at them yourself because our, the story that they tell is unbelievable in a good way it's it's the most incredible story and it, it has such resonance of truth to it and i, I really want to bring that up too when when someone is going along this path of discovering what the truth is you cannot purely base it on an intellectual – say like, okay, I'm going to try to put as much knowledge in my head as possible and try to run with it and try to throw everything in as fast as possible. You have to sit down and talk to yourself and listen to yourself and throw ideas into your subconscious and see if it, if it actually makes sense. You have to you have to use what's called intuition, which is which is this ins they, they used to call it a gut instinct because we have this almost what has been considered like a second brain in our stomach. It's this very it's this intelligence that is is occurring where we have we don't, we're not really aware that it it's there because it's not like this neurological firing thing like our brain, but we have these all these other components to our body that are allowing us to decipher truth. And anybody who's followed intuition, they know how powerful it is. I, I use my I, intuition um, to, to judge pretty much every decision, every major decision. Um, you know, if I'm outside on a nice day uh, and I want to make make the day count and do something, I'll try to always follow intuition, which I see as being directly connected to the same place that passion comes from. Um, so, so let's just try to understand that these misinterpretations that we've been told are misinterpretations. They're not. I feel that most of Zechariah Sitchin's work has been spot on, and I think anyone that wants to learn the truth of the story for themselves simply needs to go and translate them yourself if you want to. Go do it yourself off of Oxford University and learn this unbelievable story that's happened to us because all of a sudden, this battle of the eagle and the serpent, these gods, how they've controlled, um, controlled us with war, it all starts to make sense. It all starts to fall into these places where your intuition starts firing and saying, "That's right, that's truth." And you, you get a, you get a, a very powerful feeling when you're going out, when you're discovering truth and putting in the pieces together, and you know you're on the right path because the intuition in the higher self never lies. 
Um, looking at some of these pictures, though, that you have of the videos on your site, interesting one the, on the missing link of um, history. Um, this missing link, well, there, there's a lot of missing links we talk about. There's the missing link between man and ape, which many would assert you have to study the work of Zachary Sitchin to find that because it's not um, Darwin's totally got it all wrong. And, and it's uniform. Cal, let's tell about that very well, by the way. Yes, yes. But I'm um, looking at this um, picture of this specific race of Anunnaki here that um, Sitchin describes as looking like an eagle. Um, yes. I. Uh, as well as people like uh, even Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot, um, assert. Now, Sitchin's mistaken about that. That's not an eagle. That's actually a reptilian alien. And one of Sitchin's biggest blunders was that he failed to um, in, uh, acknowledge the fact that there is a lot of um, evidence from ancient Sumeria and a lot of other parts in history that there was definitely a reptilian or serpent race involved with humanity now that of course is where david ike picked up and david ike did um when arizona wilder told him that Sitchin was a shape-shifting reptilian alien in disguise, masquerading as a, as a human to disinform about the reptilians and the Illuminati. Um, said, um, well, that was just one point that David I said, well, that may explain why Sitchin warned me not to discuss reptilian aliens in my work, but I'm thinking, well, maybe this reason Sitchin did that, not because of what Wilder said. Wilder was wrong. Sitchin just probably thought, well, maybe reptilian aliens is not a, a good way to go. However, people have asserted there was an alliance made between the reptilian aliens that I talks about and the Anunnaki that Sitchin talks about, and I'm trying to, by pointing the out, connect the work of the two authors. So you can go on and say what you wanted to say. Okay, thanks. It's such a passionate place for me that I – it was such a difficult place to discern this along the way because I highly respect David Icke. Um, I credited my book because he has absolutely fantastic information. But I think there's one very important place that I think has been misrepresented, and it's – and you brought it up several times. It's this whole reptilian serpent thing. Now, do you remember when I just said this battle of symbology, which the serpent has always represented Enki's side of the family, but are they serpents? No, of course not. I think we've been deceived in so many places that even those who give us truthful information are um, – in some ways, they're deceiving the mind that is not really ready to fully comprehend. And let me explain that. In our brain, if you look at what's the, the left brain, the ancient brain, this ancient reptilian brain. Remember we talked about this balance thing, balancing the left and right part of the brain, the intellectual side, the left brain versus in the emotional side, in the right brain. And intuition, intuition and consciousness always resides in the right brain. I want to point that out. When – so we have this we have this kind of two lobes of our brain. Now, if a being is ancient, let's say, he's been alive for a million years and over that period of time has slowly eroded away and almost completely lost his right brain. And I want to point out that there are strong studies you can look right now that they're seeing where if someone does not use their right brain – for extended periods of time, neurons start to die there and brain activity will actually start refocusing on the left brain and change. So the, we, can, we can change our physiological being in which side of our brain we, we decide to function in. Now, we only have mortal lives of 121 years at a max because that's, that's when our, our, our telangiers and our cells start to degrade. That's the, our max lifespan right now. But what about a being that was a million years old? Who, who didn't have to die like these Anunnaki beings. And, and if, you don't, if you don't believe me, I highly encourage you to look at one of these cuneiform tablets called the Sumerian Kings List, which shows how long some of these god kings ruled on earth. Some of these beings were alive for, and some of them ruled for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, far longer than any, than any human person could rule. So let's look at that for a minute. If a being is no longer controlled at all by their right side of their brain, which is the mammal side. Emotions are always connected to the mammal side. The ancient left brain is always the ancient reptilian brain. It's, it's this, the ancient brain of the universe. It's the, it's the first brain, right? We can't pretend we don't need it. It's just it's not what you would focus on because then you become unbalanced. Any, any species that is completely dominant in the left brain has lost all right brain capacity is always called reptilian reptilians. Now, there are reptilian beings, and I want to go over that in a second, but I do think in many, many, many cases, they're called that by, by like the Pleiadians and, and other certain things as being one of these clever metaphors to show what they've turned into. 
that they've kind of lost the com- complete human side of themselves and that they're just a reptilian. Now, in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, though, there are lower dimensional beings because we have to understand we live in the third dimensional plane right now. That's what we perceive as reality. But there are lower dimensions just as there are higher dimensions. And many of these Anunnaki beings, they reside in, they res- reside in, in dimensions higher than us. But they're not reptilians. If you look at all the records in these cuneiform records, they and the, and the, and the pictures of them, they're just they're just people with big beards. They're just they're just humanoids. And if you start looking at how we were the missing link between apes and and, and us now, and you look at the cuneiform tablets like in Numa Elish where we were genetically jump started with their DNA, it starts to make complete sense. It starts to make complete sense how all this kind of went down. Now. Anunnaki are simply tall humanoids, like all other beings are. But there are these reptilian beings, and that's what I wanted to go over. In these lower dimensional beings, every uh, lower dimensional existent planes, there in the Emerald Tablets, Thoth talks about these beings being reptilian-like, serpent-headed, reptilian-like. That's of their actual, true physical appearance, but that they were able to have the ability to shape-shift and take on whatever they want, so they never actually take on that form. And occasionally, we see statues and representations of these serpent, very, very scary reptilian beings. And I think that there are these rep- representations of the Archons. The Archons from these lower-dimensional por- realms are the ones that also ended up had the ability to take over some of these higher Anunnaki beings. So if you have a, that reptilian dark um, serpent underworld being that they really are, and they take over a great being of the Anunnaki, well, then they kind of do re- become a reptilian, don't they? Because they become controlled like a puppet by them, and they no longer – they're, they're not no longer have really have any humanity left in there anyway. But not all of not all of these these civilizations and beings are all the same. Obviously, there are multitudes of star systems. There are multitudes of cultures, and they're all different. And not every culture is the same. Just like if you were to say, "Well, are all people in the United States um, are they all you know neo Nazis and racists?" No, that's only a little small fraction of the United States. You know, talking about current events. But there are there's always been. Within civilizations and within beings, not everyone's just one way or another, just like these great Anunnaki beings. They, are, they have completely uh, either end of the spectrums in terms of, of you know, their, um, how they perceive reality and, and, and the constructs in terms of how they perceive free will and, and, and how a being can advance itself. And so – I think a lot of this stuff has been very cleverly manipulated to trick us to think that there are these reptilian um, – like little literal reptilian beings that are like beamed here from some ship and they're like taking over and controlling everybody, whereas it's so much deeper than that's, – that's actually like a, a way to almost um, misdirect it so that people will disregard it because it's kind of it's not really how it works. You know what I mean? It's, it's a clever way to – to spin the truth in a way where um, where people can kind of be misled, and I also see this other side of the reason they push this whole reptilian thing so hard is that it does kind of reference back to Enki's symbol of the serpent and the dragon, and I think it's just another way to to have him be demonized as this as the one that's evil. It's just a way to it's a way to kind of keep history in its place. I think. Well, yeah, of course, this is another area where a lot of people will um, agree to disagree about whether the history is accurate or inaccurate. I mean, when it comes to different ET races, there's a lot of um, a lot of disinformation and a lot of uh, truth will throw it out there that causes people to agree or disagree about, like the whole thing about Zechariah, a lot of reason people can't seem to agree or disagree, for that matter, on the truth and uh, truth value of the Anunnaki creation story and uh, Nibiru and all that. Is because information and disinformation isn't thrown out regarding who and what such it was and what way it wasn't. It makes for a great radio conversation, though. So um, I, of course, love to love to talk about it whenever I get the chance. Uh, uh, so echoes of our forefathers. I want to talk a little bit about this um, uh, for a bit. JFK and secret societies. Now uh, JFK was, uh, I think, planning to expose uh, a lot of secret societies and a lot of other things that um, resulted in him being assassinated. This is something I am very familiar with having been down at Dealey Plaza for the 50th anniversary um, thing, and I and Alex Jones and a lot of other people who were down there got uh, 
got our asses whooped by some uh, d despicable uh, thugs, police thugs and all that had no authority to be there when they double-crossed us and told us we could uh, go down to Dealey Plaza. I'm going to miss Jim Mars, though, who's very big uh, who's very big on the whole um, JFK yeah. assassination and other things. May his yeah. rest in, uh, in peace of all that. Looking at this um, picture here um, on this video, the annual club just with the um, pyramid and all that, the all-seeing eye. Uh, some people assert that that is a reptilian eye in there with the, um, like the scaly images, um, like the scales around the eye that looks like, like many would assert are reptilian scales. I've even heard some people say that on the front of the dollar bill, uh, that's not George Washington, that's Adam Weishaupt, some would assert. And, um, some people, um, like historians would even assert that the image of, uh, on the $1 bill, that's, if that is meant to be Washington, as some say it's the crudest depiction ever made of him, he'd be very pissed off if he uh, were alive today and saw him depicted like that because that's not what he looked like. Well, those that say that that's Adam Weishaupt, they would say, well, yeah, that's because it's it's not him. It's all a lie. It was all uh, after the Bavarian Illuminati infiltrated um, the Freemasons. That's when Freemasonry, which is naturally a benevolent secret society, uh, took a turn for the worse and started doing a lot of unpleasant things. And Washington, of course, um, echoed... Uh, that in his letter and uh, said uh, my fellow Freemasons I'm very concerned we've been infiltrated and well um, he was right so um, I did have a 30 second degree Freemason as a guest on my show and he uh, did assert Freemasons are naturally good people all the bad things that we do is because we've been infiltrated by bad guys can you um, confirm that there is definitely truth to that that Freemasons should not be thought of as uh, bad people absolutely not um, Freemasonry was the one of these cores that that derived all the way back to uh, ancient Egypt and even Atlantean wisdom. I mean, this is actually somewhere that I, I really love to talk about a lot because it's 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 home. You know, we're talking about the United States, uh, where I happen to live. When we look at um, these founding fathers, and I, I don't um, I don't I don't agree with the reptilian stuff with the, the with the with the dollar bill or anything. I do think that the all seeing eye is is just talking about this infiltration, though it is representing this infiltration. Let, so let's go over what happened. There's always been um, – if you go all the way back to like the Druids, go back even further to um, the Egyptians, and you have this sacred – this obsession with sacred geometry and ancient history and, and knowledge, and it's been part of these very secret societies all throughout time. And the Freemasons was the oldest, most maintained of these secret societies that still exist today. Um, that let's not, let's call them the ones that aren't dark, because there are other secret societies like Bohemian Grove and Skull and Bone Society, directly connected through these elite schools like Yale and Harvard. There's this whole underbelly of these elite societies that did become dark and corrupted, and the Freemasons, um, yeah, they're they're um, they've been one of the most pure up to as late as possible until. Until, like you said, they were infiltrated, and you can see that, like I said, with these flags and crests. Go look at the 33 degree Mason pictures they show, like, um, of you know, in the last 40 years, and you'll see that double headed eagle. And then, so automatically, when you know, when you see that, you know that Ninurta and this, you know, the this war and this war god had had infiltrated, had infiltrated this, this upper echelon of, of the secret societies and slowly turn into this place now where – what do we see now with the Freemasons? You drive down the road and I have – there's signs everywhere here. It says, you know, ancient uh, ancient and accepted, and it's got a blue sign with the Freemasons. They're all over the place where I live in Maine, and those – that's a remnant of the past, but if you were to sneak into one of these lodges, right – on, on whatever night they hold, and you sneak in, and you're like, "Oh my God, I'm in a, I'm in a secret society meeting." Don't get excited because it's just a, it's just a, a skeleton shell of what it used to be. It's it's like they they infiltrated, they gutted it, and then they just left it in like these shambles. And but it used to be based on the the almost like the first 14 founding fathers, the first 14 presidents of the United States. They were all Freemasons. They were they were what we consider. The early presidents were what we consider the founding fathers, and they had these constructs that they wanted to enact because they wanted certain rights right, with our, our constitution and having these rights where we had free speech. And those were only instilled because they knew the importance of them. And um, look today at, at the remnants of what still is still around. The Washington Memorial down in D.C., that's, a, that's simply an obelisk. 
and just you just look into what an obelisk is, and it's it's just it derives right back to Egypt. There, it's it's an Egyptian obelisk, and there are, of course obelisks obelisks were built in front of great temples, and they were they were a, a sign of connecting back to the gods and higher knowledge. And so, people can think this is all crazy and all that that guy's off his rocker, but why is there Egyptian obelisk? That's been built at our at our nation's center, connecting all the way back to this ancient knowledge. And why were the first fourteen presidents Freemasons? Which is simply just Egyptian knowledge. That's all it really is. People had, I don't understand that. It's it's everything is connected. It's part of this huge connection with these ancient societies, part of the two symbologies I talked about, who have been fighting back and forth. Um, the founding fathers of, of the United States didn't want an eagle on, on the crest. They actually wanted a turkey than an eagle. Um, well, uh, hold with, on. Let me stop you right there. Yeah. I heard that that's not true with all the founding fathers. That was just true with uh, Benjamin Franklin. He um, b- wanted that. However, others who say that uh, – well, well, that's, say that's just American Revolution mythology because they would assert that the whole idea that the eagle is a symbol for America, no, we've been bullshitted. That's no eagle. That's a phoenix. So why – if that's if the, if the Freemasons and such knew about the, the phoenix and its symbolism, then that thing about um, – about them wanting a turkey doesn't really make any sense. Well, you're saying, no, 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 they did want a turkey. So what, what, can you clear up the uh, confusion here maybe? And was it just Ben Franklin or were, the, were there others? Well, I know I know that Ben Franklin is specifically the one who, who mentioned it, but the idea of not wanting an eagle was very much on the minds of George Washington and the early founding fathers. They never, ever brought up the fact that, they, that an eagle was, was, was something they wanted because they I think they did know. And you, you mentioned that it might have been a phoenix. I... When I looked at, at looked at this, there's simply variations of the same thing. I see the the double headed eagle, this Byzantine eagle, the single headed eagle, the phoenix. They're all part of the same variations of that family. They're all part of these of this mentality and the side of the of, of Venlo's side of the family of those gods who who that's that's the representation of how they ran societies and civilizations. And you can see the strong correlation with that. Look at Mesoamerica. Look at the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Inca. They were all the serpent dragon knowledge of higher wisdom, which they eventually did become warring. Um, they eventually did be- get get into blood sacrifice and war. But I want to point out that when I was visiting when I was visiting Chichen Itza last time, only a couple months ago, uh, near the Temple of the Jaguar, and we've in this really obscure area that's off the side in the shadows where nobody walks by at all. And I was looking for evidence of this because I knew that this symbolic battle had been going on all over the world. And because think about it, these conquistadors like Columbus and and, uh, Pizarro and Cortez, they were sent by the Spanish eagle. And you go look at the crest during the time, they were the the eagle power. That's why they were sent to conquer those lands. Now, so I'm in Chichen Itza. I'm looking for evidence of this struggle because – the the gods of Thoth and who was trying to represent himself as Kukul Khan and, and Quetzalcoatl, they were all the gods of this eagle, and the, um, of the serpent and the dragon. And they all tried to create civilizations based around alignments with the stars. I mean, look at the Mayans. They knew all about these, these time periods and the galactic centers and, and how um, constellations would line up in different time periods because they were given this ancient serpent knowledge. Now, I knew I knew that going forward. And I knew how much history has been suppressed. So I'm in Chichen Itza, and I'm near I'm near the Temple of the Jaguar, and I'm looking at um, I'm looking at just looking at the walls, and all of a sudden I see, of course, Kukul Khan, Thoth, one of the sons of Enki, covered in snakes and serpents all around him, and then in the center, and I put this picture up uh, all over the place as much as I can, is this eagle. Who is and it's the first representation I had seen of it in in Mesoamerica, um, and I, and I saw it, it showed an eagle with a pine cone in its mouth. And of course, anytime you look at what the pine cone represented, it was always higher knowledge and our pineal gland, and, and it just the acquisition of knowledge basically itself, the seed of knowledge. And this this eagle was eating it in its mouth, and it was it was kind of. Um, right in the center of the snakes, kind of dominating it, and Kukul Khan was being kind of pushed out of the side. And I realized that that was simply telling a story. It was telling a story of how these these empires, like the Maya and the Aztec, were being controlled by these various sides. And of course, they have no idea. They think a god coming back is the same god, and slowly it, it changes them into a warring blood sacrifice. And, and of course, eventually their empires collapse. Right? And that's 
that's what we saw all along. And 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 then you look at like um, holidays like St. Patrick's Day, where we where we talk about how St. Patrick's Day rid St. Patrick ridded the snakes from Ireland, but there's never been any snakes in Ireland. And you just look into that, and you learn that the metaphor for snakes is simply pagans and druids. Again, back to this connection to the snake knowledge, and of course the druids were responsible for 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 connecting back to Stonehenge. So all along, when the reason I seem confident and I don't try to make it in an egotistical way. I try to be confident because I've seen the evidence, how powerful it is on each side, showing this struggle all along and kind of which side has been which, and it's, it's been mimicked, and it's been, it's been all throughout our timeline for the last – at least the last 50,000 years. It's been this, it's been this struggle, and, um, and so I want to I wanna point out that once you start kind of looking at flags, which is one of the places that's been maintained – and you look all over the world at the, at the crest that they used to have during the certain time periods, it all starts to kind of correlate and make sense. What is it specifically about Mexico uh, that um, is why the, the eagle and the serpent logo is so prominent um, in, its, uh, well, in its flag? And also, as the story goes, I believe me- the story goes, Mexico City was uh, created on a lake and um, – the, uh, they, they found like a, like a serpent with an eagle uh, excuse me, an eagle with a serpent in its mouth um, in the lake um, and uh, that, that, that's the legend allegedly but um, why is it, why Mexico in particular or is it just uh, a random thing that it was just for the hell of it it was put on the flag it could be on the flag of virtually any country it's just that Mexico they decided hey it needed to be something to put on the flag we're just going to put it there it's, it's all, it all connects back it's like I said, these flags and crests have, in many cases, um, they have been changed at times. Um, that's why a lot of times family crests can contain the secrets because they tend to be older. But um, in some of these flags, like the flag of Mexico, they still retain this, like like in the records I saw at Chichen Itza, this story. It's almost like the flag itself was telling a story, and the, the legend you gave is what everyone's told. And the more I started looking into it, the more I saw that that was a manufactured lie that was actually not true at all, and it was just to create the um, a false story around why the flag has you know the, the the eagle and the serpent. Whereas, and if you look at that flag, it shows an eagle sitting on a cactus eating a serpent. Okay, um, go back to what I was just talking about um, when. One Enki's one of Enki's thought one of Enki's sons, um, his name in Egypt was Thoth. He was um, he very much he was he was Enki's favorite son. Of course, this is the side of the snake and the dragon. He wanted to create grand civilizations, and so he traveled to from the southwest United States down through Mexico and eventually all the way to South America, and he, cre- he created all of those civilizations. He was one of the main the major players behind that, and so well, that's why we saw this. Um, representation of Quetzalcoatl and, and Kukulkan to go. Now, so he he created these civilizations of the Aztec and Maya, and he was he was proud of them. They were some of his greatest accomplishments, and of course, disaster was later um, caused on them by the conquistadors, and and before that, the blood sacrifice and war. And so, when when these events had occurred, they had been kept in and, and had been shown in places like this flag and what it represented like all over the world it represented the eagle dominating over the serpent and so by putting a flag there it's like if you're an invading army you you're, you're stampede onto the other side and you and you kill them all and they or they they put their hands up and they surrender you put a flag down it becomes your territory and that's exactly what flags and crests all over the world are they're simply who governs them who is in control of those civilizations and it's not what we've been made to believe. It's not just some simply little story that there someone decided to paint onto something because it was pretty, and that's how it continued. Everything in history is connected. We just simply have to go look at the evidence to see how it's connected. And in this case, um, they were talking about the conquering of these great cities like Teotihuacan and Tenochtitlan, which today Tenochtitlan is is where Mexico City is, and that's where the whole story comes from because. Tenochtitlan used to ex- it was this it was this Aztec city that was on this giant lake, the shallow lake, and it was part of this horrible battle between where 
uh, Cortez came in and pretended he was the god um, Quetzalcoatl, whereas he wasn't. And they um, they basically closed off all the entryways to the city, and they made everyone starve and suffer and die. The events of history are so tragic, tragic and horrible. The countless um, deaths that have been caused by these conquests, and yet we've been made to believe that they're heroes in our storybooks. That's how history has been manipulated and turned around, whereas if you think about the history of what the United States really is, a place like the U.S., from the perspective of these Native Americans, they just simply had all their land stolen. They were killed with disease and war, and that's that's the real story behind it. And we have to understand that, that we have to look at history and the events in an objective way and try to figure out you know, which side is true. And um, – in, in in Mexico, that representation of of the of the eagle eating the serpent was Cortez conquering. This was the head. This was the heart of the Aztec Empire. Tenochtitlan was their major city. It, was, it had over two hundred thousand people at one point, making it the largest cultural center in Mexico in, in probably entire uh, all of Central America or Mexico at the time. And so. Conquering that place was conquering the entire Aztec Empire, and so what more fitting than to create this little fairy tale, but really it was about the eagle conquering over the serpent because we have to understand that Enki had a son named Thoth, and Enlil had a son named Ninurta, and of course what would two, – the, the two, um, two sons like this would always be competing. On either side, and that's that's always what this was about, because Ninurta was always the the Byzantine eagle, the war, the war empire and under his father, and of course Thoth was always the the um, wanting to create enlightenment and, and um, connecting sacred geometry for his under his father Enki. So that's why you had this family struggle using these symbols all over the world, and of course the eagle ended up winning and stamped out. All of these cultures of the serpent dragon all over the world, and so all we have left are, you know, places in China where they still have the dragon flying, and places like that. And, and we look back at the fact that their early cultures are based on practicing meditation and martial arts and, and being deeply spiritual, and that's why it always connects back. It always connects back to us understanding how we've been kind of pawns in in, the, in the, this struggle on, on two different sides. Um, are there any like <laughs> bits of advice that you can give to, to those people that are totally lost in a trance to, to, to help um, make sense of the, how this is a, uh, a matrix prison planet? I mean, I mean, it's easier said than done yeah. to wake someone up. Yeah. So my advice, I tried to do this with the book. The entire book is supposed to be this this uh, order, just specifically what you're asking actually just to slowly bring people up to speed of, of where what the situation is they're dealing with and what my recommendation is to people is start slow reconnect with nature go back and just don't even worry about all this insanity of trying to learn about every event in history and all these things just slow down reconnect with yourself become healthy get out in nature get away from the city spend time with yourself, get your thoughts in order, get yourself clear, then start ticking on understanding things, reformatting things once you're ready. Once you feel clear and you're ready to take things on, take it in steps. Just start by learning as much as you can with the world around you. Understand this this beautiful place we live in and then start understanding kind of like I was saying, understand how energy works, understand um, how important the ecosystem is, understanding what they're doing to our – financial systems and just try to understand just these basic components of how our reality is working and don't try to get too deep until you're ready for it because if you follow steps of of, of what you're ready for you'll you'll be much less likely to reject it and that doesn't mean you can't push yourself because in some cases like i said the, the road down to truth is the most difficult thing you'll ever do it doesn't mean it's not going to it's not going to be easy it just means you're ready to take on a challenge when you're when you when you feel that you're ready, and so follow it in stages and steps. Under real, start um, reading about esoteric things like what is really is consciousness. How how does um, technology affect our our energy body here, and, and all these various things. And you start in, and then of course the world starts taking on a different meaning to you. You start realizing that. When you're, you know, when you're in up, you're spending eight to ten hours or more at work, 
and you get home and you're completely exhausted, you then develop the awareness to recognize maybe I have a certain amount of energy that gets expended during the day and you, you, you start to put the pieces together that if someone was to redirect their energy into certain areas, they could all of a sudden find major growth in their life. They, everything could change. If they were to say – um, and change their life in, in, in many ways. Like instead of watching TV for so and so hours, I'm going to decide to go hiking or I'm going to decide to do some research into history or whatever it is. Read a good book or something. By by changing the energy of where you focus yourself and your attention, you can change everything. You can all of a sudden start putting on this these this kind of um, accelerated. Um, place where all this, where you felt like you were a, a, a stagnant point in your life, where maybe you weren't really changing much, you you be. It's amazing how fast we can actually change. Because for me, I didn't. Um, I haven't been researching truth since I was like a child or anything. The, a lot of this happened in a, a much shorter time period than than some may realize. Of of even the mind boggling. Um, Putting together of so many con- concept th- um, things, people can do it in, in a much shorter times than they realize if they take it in steps and stages and don't take on too much. And that's a problem for the way that I tend to. Um, and of course, it's something that I'm working on. Is if I if I'm with somebody, like just sitting down talking to them, and I want to try to go a certain direction with information to try to help them and they're with me right and they're oh yeah that makes sense that makes sense and i get to a certain point and i start i just keep going to me i have to be able to tell myself to shut off and then let them marinate with that to figure it out but of course you know that that's something i'm still working on is that i tend to keep going and i end up going to the point where i lose them and then every the progress i had made then gets lost too because then they end up getting kind of lost within all of it. So we have to just take this in stages and steps. And and, and if we do that, um, you can – I call them laying down foundations of truth. You lay down a foundation you know is true. Like you, you lay down the foundation of I know that I'm happy when I'm doing these activities and, and I'm – this is how I feel the best. Well, then do those things only. Lay down those things. You lay down foundations of ways you know you can change and, and information that you can take in at certain times, and you just kind of follow that progression. Well, this also raises another um, question, a very hotly debated um, subject as to another thing people constantly agree to disagree on, the extent to which um, it's okay for people to have an I want to be a slave mentality. I have been asserting on some of – many of my previous shows actually that um, it is something you don't have a right to do. Well, you have a right to do anything that does not result in you causing harm or intending to cause harm to another person or property through negligence or deliberate intent. Well, if you really think about it, wanting to be a slave or wanting to be a sheeple, if you want to be that, you're actually causing harm. Because by be- wanting to be a slave, you are actually making it easier for the powers that be to control all the other people who don't want to be a slave. So uh, using that logic alone, you can deduce, okay, you are harming society by wanting to be a slave. Therefore, you don't have a right to be a slave. Therefore, the- those of us that do not want to be slaves have the right to hassle and harass those who want to be slaves to wake them up out of their trance. And if they refuse to wake up, then um, dare I say it, then we have the right to do to them. Them, what that guy in the movie they lived did to his friend who refused to put on the glasses. <laughs> now, many people would assert that's <laughs> way off the deep end, and you should never ever <laughs> resort to that. Um, but then again, um, can we use violence? And how, what kind of violence should we use to those that don't want that want to be slaves to wake them up? If we are to accept, okay, you don't have a right to be a slave. We have the right to force them to wake up. Well, uh, that's something that I think we have to take a strong stance on. Uh, there should never be violence involved in truth. Um, you know, during revolutions, if we need to fight against ourselves with some, you know, militia government or something, that's a different story. I'm talking, but in our current reality right now of being a civilized society trying to move forward, there, sh- there shouldn't there shouldn't be any reason why we have to try to have to, you know, physically harm someone to try to have them um, find the truth because the way it really works is. When you start looking into the constructs of what's kind of allowed for us here, you learn that you know we are incarnating into this into this planet. This is a reincarnation place. That's what that's why this has always been here. And part of that is that we have free will. 
And that's why our timeline has been so manipulated on so many levels is that if if you have free will, it basically allows any, anything to happen. It means that manipulation could happen on either end of the spectrum. You could either be manipulated to reach the highest state you possibly could because it and given and given that information or you could be manipulated because it really they are both manipulations it's a manipulation of how someone thinks you could be manipulated by those who want to keep you in a certain state and don't want you to reach um, a higher conscious state because then you start becoming kind of what we consider a co-creator of reality of our thoughts and the, and that's the idea that we were, we were talking about earlier, everything is simply based on vibration and that physical – the physical reality is not quite, quite what we think it is. And the way that kind of works and it's kind of – you're getting into quantum physics and stuff is, is that our mind in, is so powerful, us as, as mortals here. We're so powerful that if we knew how to control our mind in a certain way, like some of the ancients did, you can actually manipulate reality. And, and we are actually doing that on a collective level. Because um, most of society is going with the narrative that's given, the um, reality is going a certain way. That's how it's working. Simple as that. People are accepting this fear mentality of the world, and that's how reality is manifesting. On the other side… If people decided they didn't want this any longer and they refused to buy into all this stuff, it would just kind of all collapse and disappear. The only reason why all these things are going on is that people are supporting their po politicians and governments and buying into that they have their best interests and that they should be spending – like 80% of their money into defense or something like insane like that, like we have right now. Um, and that's just, that's a manipulation of the people to try to make them think that their education and their health and their food and their well being of their own place is far less important than their own security. Whereas there's not really any security concerns to begin with, and it's all just kind of chess matches with armies kind of fighting against each other. Whereas – and I want to bring up an incredibly powerful quote, um, and it, one of these quotes that everybody can go look up too is that on her deathbed – and I, I wrote this in the book. This is one of those powerful quotes you could ever read. On her deathbed, uh, Meyer Amschel Rothschild's um, wife, who was the mother of these sons who became um, – who were sent off to all these different cities to become bankers, which, which is how this whole system is, is created. How these wars are all done is they simply just finance each side of the same war. That's been happening all along. So on her deathbed, she is dying, and she no longer cares anymore, and she's, and she's passing on to, to the – you know, and she says right before she's about to die, if my sons – did not want war, there would be none. And it, it's like the most powerful statement because you realize and you look at history and you look at the eagle, all these things I've been talking about and these families that have been kind of doing the bidding of these, of these gods, you realize that they've been just manufacturing all these wars and these events like the sinking of the Lusitania in World War I and the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam, they're all just these created staged events. I mean you look at you look at Pearl Harbor there's the hard evidence that they knew days before and even just completely allowed because they needed a reason that Pearl Harbor was going to was going to occur and the more you look at it the more you see that there may have ne not been any war if it wasn't for them and that's an extremely disturbing thing to think about is that our own instability that's blamed on our supposed barbaric past evolutionary ways is actually just this derived uh, push timeline to keep us in such a mentality of violence and fear that we're going to will that to happen. Look at the, the Roman Empire. While their citizens are watching this entire Roman Empire collapse, kind of like the United States right now, by the way, they would just simply use things to distract them, like the Roman games. They'd have these great showings of violence to keep them all, the masses all distracted. Of course, that's a two-part thing, right? You keep people in a violent mentality and you keep them entertained. It's perfect. Whereas all these problems and these things never ever get looked at because they're being distracted. Well, look today. Look at, our, look at all the things that are shown on TV. 
lost in this world of reality shows where we live other people's lives and all these weird, strange things. Watching barbaric sports all the time, it really hasn't changed. It's just to keep us distracted in this state where we'll allow this continuous um, tyranny to occur. I mean, if you think to yourself right now, if you're any kind of a conscious person, and you think that other people are evil, and you're gonna go over to some country and and you know have a, get a gun and shoot them. That person has done nothing to you. They're not. They haven't even done anything bad, probably to anybody. They're just some enlisted person for the army, just like you were. You know why are people killing each other when they they have no reason to based on something that the other person has done to them. It's almost like madness if you start thinking of it objectively, of like how someone could be sent off to some place and never come home again. And we and and yet we're made to believe that that's honorable and and great. Yeah, it's the it's the most it's the most the biggest sacrifice you could ever make, but the point is it wasn't necessary. You know, we didn't people don't have to die just so that these these banking families can have some piece of territory be changed over and for whatever whatever, you know, controlling idea that they want for it. So if we start zooming out from history objectively, we look at all these events and we look at how everything's going, it almost makes you sick. It makes you feel like you're in a nightmare because we are in a nightmare right now. And but we're waking up from that nightmare. And I like to point out that it's that that phrase that everybody uses that's very accurate it's always darkest before the dawn that's always that's very true as we leave this time of pisces and enter the time of aquarius in 2025 we're in that changeover right now we're in the darkest before the dawn now let's just get to the dawn and how do we get to the dawn well we have to come together as a collective a collective conscious community to like you said People are pawns in all this. How do they not become pawns? Well, take control of your mind. Take control of your consciousness. Become a, become your own um, sentient conscience being where you now are in control of your own thoughts. Because when you do that, you change far more than you realize. And we're all we're all part of this. And so we have to we have to kind of we have to come together and get on the same page with saying, well, let's all find the truth because we're not being told the truth. You know, the the head of the Egyptian Egyptologist has been this hand-picked person who's been in charge of, of, of that department for years and years and years and years. And whenever evidence comes up, they always completely turn it down and dismiss it. And nobody thinks about that. Nobody connects the fact that we just had sonar or we just had radar that penetrated below the Great Pyramid of Giza and the Sphinx and found these massive underground tunnels. That came out in the news, but nobody wonders why nothing's been followed up. Right. That's how we're like we're kept completely, completely ignorant in the fact that we're so caught up in all these things that distract us in our own little world, in our own lives, that all these things that happen, we never even ask anything. We never even say, what are those giant tunnels under there? Hey, wait a minute. If you read into ancient history, you find that there's supposed to be massive underground tunnels under, under the Great Pyramid of Giza and under, and under the Giza Plateau. Maybe these are the halls of Amente, right? That you start to realize that the reason why we haven't been told what those tunnels are is because it, back, it, con- it connects back to the very same thing that we've been talking about all along, is that the history has been hidden from us and that we have to find it ourselves. And some authors have broken out, but they're still – somewhat considered not mainstream so we have to be we have to be careful where information comes from and we have to try to lay put down these foundations of what we know is truth within ourselves and by doing that we can we really can change everything in our life and it's it's difficult but it's necessary when you agree andrew yeah but since you mentioned that thing about it being not mainstream it's pretty very uh makes you want to do a double face palm if you will that in order for something to be acknowledged as fact the government and or mainstream media has to acknowledge it when you realize yeah. the government and mainstream media lie lie some more and lie even when telling the truth would do it good it yeah. makes no sense to to think that they have to say for it in order to be acknowledged as fact but but that's how people work andrew i know and it's pathetic and, and sad and speaking of how things work um you mentioned quantum i wanted to get into a little bit of this and also another subject subject that that's kind of become pertinent now because of the way people are going to handle the re, the upcoming eclipse um well first of all 
of um, quantum reality. Um, I have often asserted that what is God? What is the creator? What is, well, its source, it God, creator, whatever you want to call yep. it. It is infinite consciousness. Now, where am I making that assertion? Uh, two things. One, the double slit experiment and how what it implies, um, and also the uh, mathematics behind the Mandelbrot set um, and how the, the, the fact that no matter what you do to any part of the Mandelbrot set, no matter how small you zoom into the... Um, the, the infinite Mandelbrot set, which is a boundless but finite figure that looks like a beetle, yeah, um, you will affect every other part within the greater Mandelbrot set, even at the smallest, minute amounts. What does that imply? Well, it implies that blinking your eyes will affect the winds on the planet Neptune, albeit at an extremely small level that's, for all intents and purposes, non-existent. Yeah. But that's how reality works, is everything is infinite, and um, everything is affected in the greater whole. Right? Exactly. Yeah. But um, this whole thing about um, whether or not we should obsess about quantum reality, um, some would say that quantum physics, that's the nature of how the third dimension of consciousness works. And if you obsess about how the third dimension of consciousness works, the physics behind it, which is quantum physics, you will keep yourself trapped within the, the third dimensional construct. Therefore, you need to get metaphysical and move beyond what the, um, the, the quantum physics textbooks um, assert, but then again, many would say, well, you got to understand how quantum physics works to understand this reality if you actually want to ascend beyond this reality. So what's your take That's on right. this debatable? Oh, you agree it, with that? Okay. Yes, absolutely. That was well said right at the end. I agree that there are so many layers to understanding how the universe – and by, actually, you gotta, really got to call it the multiverse – but we're going to call it the universe just for simplistic terms here. The, the complexity of the universe is so far beyond what even humanity has reached yet in its stages. I, we have even – we've only touched the surface of it that that's how it's been so easy to mislead us because our perceptions are so limited to this visible light spectrum. Whereas it's very easy to mislead us. So let's look at – you mentioned quantum physics, learning how energy – reacts to everything around it and how we are part of this kind of holographic um, vibrating world and that things are not as solid as we think they are. And then we zoom out past that and we start learning and adding in the fact that dimensions, there are dimensions above us and dimensions below us and that – and kind of how – we even have to look at how time works and how, how time and space works and how well, if you're looking at a star in the distance and that light is just reaching to you um, and that certain amount of time has gone by, is that light coming from the same dimension as you? I mean it's, it's so complicated beyond us that it, we're almost just like putting the pieces together right now of understanding this complexity. Now, what is all that complexity, right? How is it possible that we could have this, this – such a complex and designed universe that – if you look into it, if it was in such a way that was differing by just a small degree of you know, design for how gravity works and how all these various components work to, to, to um, the universe itself, if it was even a fraction of a, of, a, of, a, of a degree off what it is now, like everything would collapse and nothing would work. It's, it's so perfect that you, you see that it's almost like it, it gives the design out for itself. You know what I mean? It's, so when you look at something like the golden ratio, the Fibonacci sequence, we look at these connected things where we look at an ancient shell and we look at things like the universe and we look at a flower and we look at all these things and we see that it's all connected through this spiral. Look at the image of the background of your show. It's always connected to these, this, this sacred geometry of everything in the universe and how it all derives from the same design only you – know, you know, it could almost go like infinitely smaller. Like if you took, if you took a, a cell of a human body, um, the, way it, the way it looks, it almost looks like, like an entire galaxy or they, it, it has like components of something far larger than itself. So everything is, is so creatively designed. And so perfectly designed that it it screams for some kind of a, a a creative being that's that's made it, and that's the the amazing aspect to me behind when you realize what the term God really is, and that it's not this um, these Yahweh and these beings who have pretended they're God. Of course, and that's been the big thing here is, is these beings to pretend they're God, whereas. The, the term God to me has been a very polluted term, and I don't use it anymore. I use something like source or prime creator or, or whatever 
or ever these various terms back to this creative design behind the universe itself in that if you look at the constructs behind it it's almost perfect right it's there's this it's like this like gets back to shakespeare to me it's this great stage of experience where every expression is allowed here everything's possible and that's why all these evil things and all these good things are allowed to happen because every expression is possible but there are very creative constructs put in place so that those who do evil actions will have ramifications in the future so that there will be some hidden design behind how how the, the reality and how the timelines of the universe go. So how does that work? Well, if you do something terrible, you have something called karma. And when you re- reincarnate in another life, that karma is going to follow you. It's the energy that you you have done cuz like you said the idea of you just flapping your eye, your eyelids and having that have some small impact on neptune everything has an impact it's why it's called the butterfly effect every action we have has an has an equal reaction so we, that's why we have to realize that our actions in this world matter and yet of course we've been made to believe that they're not they're all just random and meaningless but if we realize that we're part of something great part of something that's connected to the entire universe itself we'll then look at how we're spending our time and the and and what we're doing with our energy in a completely different fashion because we'll connect back to the fact that we're part of this great story and that's why i go back to shakespeare because if you look at the fact that he realized on, on a very deep level, he was a very, very smart man, he realized that there were these actors and there were these extras and there were these um, malevolent and benevolent forces and that they were all playing roles. It was just all roles of energy and roles of energy and expression here. And that's kind of how the foundation of the whole thing works. And so if you do good things – those actions will follow you into other reincarnations and other timelines, and you'll affect entire sequences of, of your reality by doing certain things. So you, we're in this life right now. like right, Everybody is in this reality where they have a certain amount of time before, before it's up until they have to start over again. And the trick is that every time you start over when you're born, you forget everything, but you still retain certain things like reflexes and – Certain gifts that you had developed, um, quantum thinking, the ability to um, think about things in, 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 in multiple ways rather than just a singular thought. And these types of things follow us just like these dark things follow us that we've done. So if you've, if you've murdered people and you've done horrible things, then just imagine how maybe you, your incarnation may go on another life or whatever various things it may, it may impact and follow you all along. And that's kind of how a lot of these archonic and lower dimensional beings get kind of trapped in their own, in their own hell. Because lifetime after lifetime, if you do these – if you – are evil and wicked, you can eventually become trapped and exist only in the lower dimensions. You no longer retain that light spark of a, of, of being in um, the uh, the third dimension and above. And that's that's how I see beings all throughout time. If you want to get real deep, getting caught in this lower dimensional world. I mean, these are all just entities that have. Um, thrust themselves of various beings all over the universe who have thrust themselves throughout their actions to eventually exist in this lower state. It's all just states of vibration, right? If you were to do horrible things, I just finish up really quick. If you were to do horrible things, you're going to have a lower vibration. If if dimensions are based on certain states of vibration, then all lower dimensional states are based on a low, very very low dimensional state. Just like. If someone reaches their highest state, they're reaching a higher state of vibration. That's why dimensions are the way they are. You're reaching higher states of yourself. Yes, and speaking of vibrations, um, it has been asserted by um, those who can communicate allegedly with entities of higher consciousness that the idea of string theory is not a theory. It is a fact. There may be a few things kinks in it that haven't been worked out. But yes, everything at its most basic level is um, comprised of vibrating strings so that's something that 
people yeah. I think is definitely worth um, researching a little bit further. Um, by the, just for the hell of it, I, I hate to cherry pick and nitpick like this, but uh, you mentioned William Shakespeare. Uh, you do realize that the actor William Shakespeare did not actually write the Shakespeare plays. They were actually written by Sir Francis Bacon and his minions. But you just you realize, I, I'm sure you just when you reference Shakespeare, you're just uh, uh, referencing the uh, like the mythological Shakespeare. Yeah, that's very good. That's very good. And Francis Bacon is actually, if you want to get into the founding fathers and who is the inspiration behind this new Atlantis and, and, and this new founding country of freedom, Francis Bacon was actually the one who is directly responsible for that. Thank you for bringing that up. Francis Bacon is a fascinating figure throughout history who I see has um, a very benevolent and very good figure who has been trying to help all along. Is he some great being, some great being who is just kind of using that Francis Bacon person to kind of influence things? I think so. It's very interesting. Yes. One um, since you mentioned Atlantis, one quick thing you mentioned uh, um, uh, Enki. Um, that's the equivalent of the uh, Greek god Poseidon, and endless the equivalent of um, uh, Zeus. S since you mentioned that, um, when I had Eric von Daniken on, I talked a little bit about Atlantis. He is de is strongly of the opinion, and so is this uh, guy Frank Joseph Hoff, who I recently had on again, um, talking about how Poseidon is the founder of of Atlantis. But that uh, it, I mean, does that make sense? I mean, if you believe yeah. that Enki um, like came along with the Anunnaki 450,000 years ago or so, and uh, genetically engineered humanity um, or like 300,000 years ago, Atlantis would have been after that. Does it make sense? Is there like a part of history that we're not including that maybe you can uh, elaborate on and say, yeah, that same ancient sure. was the one that create, helped found Atlantis? This, that's a great point. So Atlantis is a fascinating thing. Again, one of these things, just like all these categories, starts to really make sense, doesn't it? All these things are the most important, are the, sim are the ones that have been made to a myth, into a myth or inverted. And that's how history works. Go to one of our most important philosophers, Plato. In the Timaeus and Critias, he talks extensively about Atlantis. He talks about how it's west of the Pillars of Hercules, which we know is Morocco and Spain, and how it, it disappeared and was destroyed around 9,000 years before him. And then we look at geologic records of these cataclysms that were on Earth and how the Bible talks about these floods. And we start connecting all of these cuneiform tablets like the Atrahasis talking about this flood. And it starts to really make sense that something terrible occurred on the Earth between 13,000 and 12,500 years ago that wiped out what we consider an entire golden age of civilization. Now, Francis Bacon... And these founding fathers were simply trying to emanate and recreate what was lost in Atlantis. Now, you brought up a good point where um, who, is, who is the god of Atlantis? Well, Atlantis, his, his, the god of Atlantis, the founder, was, was Enki, who was Poseidon. And, of course, his, his brother was on the other side of him. The war eagle brother was Zeus. We're going to make that clear. And it goes all the way back to if you look at the fight of the Titans versus the Olympians. The Olympians were simply Zeus's side, and the Titans were simply Poseidon and his army. And it represented these, this great battle that had occurred in Atlantis because Atlantis was originally propped up as this conscious, enlightenment, sophisticated city far beyond what we even have now. And it was on the subcontinent that used to exist on the, where the Atlantic Fault is right now. It makes sense how something like that could disappear if it's on a major fault line. And so, especially out in, in the middle of the ocean. Um, Poseidon created this city around higher consciousness. And of course, it was, it was, a, it was a city based on this, this snake dragon wisdom, right? Just like Thoth then wanted to create with the Mayans and the Aztec and the Inca. That's why it's all connected. It's this, these Atlantean connections. And that's why if you go to the records of, of, um, of Teotihuacan, you can go and find the whole connection with Dr. Doriel and the Emerald Tablets and connecting back to where Thoth calls himself Thoth the Atlantean. Just it's exactly right there in these writings talks about how he simply was trying to recreate these civilizations of Atlantis, right? So Atlantis, Atlantis was destroyed in these, in these cataclysms that had to do with the same type of scenario we're kind of entering right now. It's, it's these, these horrible – these impacts from this planetary body that exists and connections with comets and meteors and tsunamis and pole shifts. There may have been multiple disasters that all occurred in, in a 500-year period, a 500 to 1,000-year period that was also responsible at the same time 
Think about all of these megafauna that existed all over the northern hemisphere. I've talked about this in past shows. I have a show called Global Cataclysms and the End of the Golden Age of Civilization on my channel. Check it out if you're interested in this area. But I talk about how these – you think about the saber-toothed tiger and the woolly mammoth and all of these creatures across the northern hemisphere that just disappeared overnight. Not over, not overnight, but literally overnight if you look at geologic timelines. Some of them have been found fl- flash frozen, and because there have been these – disasters that have caused such drastic climate changes that we've had massive extinctions. And I want to point out, it's very interesting to look at where the remaining megafauna on our planet in their more original form still existed, like Africa, far away from where these ice fields were. And it's, it's, it starts to kind of correlate with how events in, in our history have, have, have happened, connecting with how a, a great Golden Age could have been lost. You know, the origins of how, when the pyramids were built and Atlantis and, and Golbeki Tepe and, um, and a lot of these ancient places across the world that are, that are truly ancient, old, they, they tie to this golden age that was wiped out. And I, I call it, um, the time we're in right now, I call us, um, kind of, Humanity with amnesia, because after these disasters occurred, it's it's talked about in the Atrahasis how Enlil then took advantage of that and 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 recreated and took control of reality to then manipulate and cover all this up. That's why we don't understand the truth, because since that disaster occurred, where very few humans actually even survived, and that's true. And Noah was simply the name of Atrahasis, we made to believe just like Atlantis that he's a myth. But his name was actually Adrahasis, and it represented the, his DNA surviving. And so after that point occurred, it, you can read about how it talks about how they decided to control our timeline and history and never let us know the truth of what had occurred. With the secrets of our DNA connecting all the way back to Atlantis and all of these things, there, that's why all these lies and that's why the truth is so big because they've had to hide it for the la- since these events of the last 400,000 years.